at the edge of the familiar, where your comfort zone ends and the unknown stretches before you. That's where greatness awaits. Are you ready to take that leap? This is the Risk Big Podcast with your host, Travis Fitzwater. I am here with Beth Snyder from One Canoe Two, who started this business in 2009, 2008. Yeah, it depends on how you count it, but yeah, 2000. <laughs> we say 2009, really. That's a, that was the turning point yeah. where we were like, let's do this. Great. Well, thank you for joining me. I really yeah. appreciate it. It's yeah. great to be in your office here in Fulton. It's so unique, you know, walking through your shipping department and your <laughs> your front the front area where you have all your products. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit about what One Canoe 2 is? Sure. Um, Well, the current incarnation where we are now, um, so we have a building here in Fulton, um, right on the main historic business district street. So what most people know us for is that we have a shop downstairs called One Canoe 2 Papery. Um, It's 500 square feet, and it's really the tip of the iceberg as far as the business goes. So the business has been around for a long time, but the shop just opened about a year ago. And the shop does like a half a percent of our total business, our total revenue for the year. Um, But our main business is that uh, we're artists and we create stationery from that artwork. So we do greeting cards and calendars are a huge, we do huge amounts of calendars, um, planners, any kind of, anything printed on paper, um, artwork. So all our work is done here um, within, within our team. We have a little art team and then we manufacture things Really, the majority of it is manufactured in Jeff City, actually, um, at our printer. But we do do some stuff overseas, you know, things that are that we just can't source um, in the U.S. So we we do a pretty big business. Seventy um, percent of our business is wholesale, which means we sell a box of three hundred cards to a like a shop, a boutique, or stationery store, or sometimes as big as like a pottery barn or Anthropology is one of our big customers. Um, So that's 70% of our business. So we sell that at half of what retail costs. So if you buy a calendar from us, it's $20. We're selling it for $10 to these wholesale customers. So then 20% of our business is retail. It's all online. um, And people order, you know, one planner or one whatever, and we ship it to them. So we have a really big shipping operation. Um, We ship out between, I'd say, 600 and 1,000 orders in a normal month. And then Cyber Monday, we shipped out 925. Um, yeah, so UPS is here every day, USPS is here every day. And that's really that's really exciting. And like year over year, what's what was Cyber Monday like last year compared to this year? Was so it? this year we did 50% better than last year. Wow. So half again better, which is incredible. It was our best Cyber Monday yeah. ever. So you've got to be thrilled, but also you got no sleep. Yeah. Have... <laughs> Actually, we, we have it down to a science now. So there's um, we have 10 permanent employees some part-time, some full-time, but 10 of us are like work here all the time. So um, Liz, who's in charge of shipping, and Jalen, who's in charge of production, they set out a schedule of when people are working, they set up stations, and every one of us, from me to the marketing people to everybody, packed orders for about three days. (laughs) So, you know, we just worked in shifts, and um, everybody's got a good attitude. It's really, it's it's exciting, because it's it's fun to see all those customers. I mean, I never ship packages normally, but I wrote out a lot of notes and a lot of the people who came through on my packing list were people I know. So, you know, I got to see what they ordered. I got to send them a personal note. I got to touch the customers in a way that I haven't since we first started the business, you know? Yeah, so. and I want to keep going on this path, but before yeah. we get there, I want to yeah. kind of give people a basis for how you started this thing and, and how, just your story at the beginning. Sure. So can you tell me how like the thought behind starting now you've had this entrepreneurial desire for your whole life you know you yeah. talk about in fourth grade yeah. you were this entrepreneur selling <laughs> selling stuff at school talk about like where that started and this idea started yeah so i mean i've had little crafts arts businesses like my whole life i mean i just had this something about my biology <laughs> my makeup i just want to make stuff i love to make things in production i used to make friendship bracelets i made jewelry um I always tell the story that I got to the principal's office in fourth grade because I had a friendship bracelet business that was basically a pyramid scheme. The other <laughs> girls didn't understand how, like, you know, supplies and gross margin and all that worked. Um, and my dad was a superintendent, so that was very embarrassing to him and to me that I ended up in the principal's <laughs> office. Um, but then when I was in high school, I owned a business called Beth's Bottles and Beads, which is pretty funny. Um, but I sold tons of stuff. I made jewelry. I made these um, glass bottles that had clay on them. And because my parents 
are super supportive people and they're like, you want to do this? We'll help you. My mom gave me $250. She wrote it on a legal pad that she, <laughs> that I owed her $250 and I made a bunch of stuff and she helped me go sell it at stores and to craft fairs and all kinds of stuff. So not to be crass and talk about money, but by the time I went to college, I had $40,000 in the bank from this business that I, I had. I don't think that's crass <laughs> as much as that's incredibly encouraging because nowadays kids are going in, right. there's no way for them to pay with cash, especially if right. they're going to get a job like at a restaurant or a right. minimum wage yeah. job. Yeah. I there's like no to say, way you can accumulate 40, both of my dollars. sisters worked as a waitresses at the truck stop in Kingdom <laughs> City. Now, they turn, one of them is a lawyer. Which, by the way, is not a bad thing. No, it's, it's not, not bad. They worked yeah. their butts off, but they had to work around you know, their sports schedules and stuff, whereas I, I just did all the activities I wanted, and then I would go home and in my free time work in my little studio in my room. You know, Now, my sisters who worked at the truck stop there, now one is now a lawyer and one is an attorney, or one is a doctor. So, so they do okay for themselves. They did fine. <laughs> well, and now I'm, the, you know, I'm an artist in there. Yeah. Whatever. It's fine. I like my life the best, though, for sure, because I get to make it exactly what I want. Sure. So, so anyway, I went to college at Mizzou and I got a degree in art and I got tired of that little business. I just wanted to be a college student. Um, and I worked at the TV station KOMU when I was in college doing design for production and um, commercials and set design. I shot for furniture for the set. Um, and then when I left college, so I graduated in 2002 um, with a degree in fine art, you know, and 2002, the internet was definitely around, but e-commerce was nothing like what it is now. Sure. I mean, Etsy wasn't around then or whatever. So I was like, I like Columbia, but I'm not going to get a job here. Like, there's no, what are my options for creative jobs? So I ended up getting a job at the CBS TV station in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and I worked there for six years, and I loved it, and I loved Nashville. I loved that job. I, <laughs> I did everything from mugshots to county maps, um, really? like graphics, whatever. It was a great... It was really great to have that job, to have a couple of corporate jobs I did have before owning this company because I got to see how HR systems work. I got to see, you know, I we had this incredible woman who was the leader of that company and she put all these diversity initiatives into place and she was just an incredible role model for being a level-headed person who, who cared very personally about people but ran the company like a real badass, basically. I mean, she was just, she was incredible. So, um, I always think that there's like a silver lining or um, some sort of sleeper skills that you pick up, even in a job that maybe isn't your dream job, you know? Sure. I got really fast at things because I had a 4 o'clock, a 5 o'clock, a 6 o'clock deadline for those newscasts. So I got really fast at designing, which I think did help me later on. Sure. So, um, so when I lived in Nashville, I was always like doing some little something to make money. Like I painted murals for people. I went to craft shows and sold my paintings. I sewed purses, I sewed things, and I just made stuff and was always trying to like hustle up a little side money. Yeah. I, I don't know why, I just love to do that. I think it's like the ultimate scorecard that but somebody you, would spend money on your what you But do. you were getting really good at all these side hustles. You know, right. This is helping you kind of develop an idea of yeah. what you were going to get into later. Yes, totally, totally. So, I mean, I was always hoping that someday I could work for myself, but I'm also just really practical. So. I was like, I'm not going to quit this, quit working until I really have something going on. I don't know what that is. Um, and I have tons of hobbies. So my then boyfriend bought me this little antique letterpress for Christmas in the 2007, I guess, for Christmas. And I called my childhood friend Carrie and I said, why don't you draw some stuff? Because she was such a good artist and we had always talked about doing a little something of some kind. And I said, why don't you draw some stuff and come down and we'll print it on this little letterpress. Um, and so she did and we did that. And then we thought, oh, that'd be fun if we started a company. And so we had been on lots of canoe trips together when we were in college. And um, it just came around that we thought one canoe, two girls had a nice ring to it. So one canoe, two, that's where we came up with that name. Um, and we opened an Etsy shop in May of 2008, I think. So I was still living in Nashville then. And then um, I was getting married and I was looking around and living in Nashville and thinking, like, the math here is not going to work out that great for having kids. Like... We're going to have to live 45 minutes out in the suburbs to be in a good school district, and then we're going to have a commute, and how are we going to pay for this? And, you know, in a big city, it's just kind of a rat race sometimes. You yeah. have to make a lot more money to, to make it. And I always loved Callaway County. I loved living near my parents. So I picked up my husband, and I got a job back home, and I left. Um, and I worked at that job at a farming magazine as an art director for three years. And the whole time that that so was, that was going on... 2008. Or 2009, yep. 2008, mm -hmm. 2009 yep. to 2011, 2012. Right. Yep. So that whole time that I was working that job, of course, I didn't have a kid then. So um, 
I was side hustling one canoe too. And most of the time I was working like 60 ish hours a week at my day job and then another 40 for one canoe too. So we would print on Saturdays all day. I would print at night. My husband and I um, ran the shipping department out of our house (laughs) in the evenings. I mean, we'd spend two hours a night shipping packages and writing handwritten notes to all of our customers from Etsy. I mean, Etsy really, we wouldn't be here without Etsy because that started and we got on that we got on that website at a time when you could really get noticed. Um, and it generated a lot of its own publicity. Like now we wish that we had some sort of traffic funnel that would so easily without so much effort or spending money on digital ads, we wish it would come our way. Um, but Etsy really launched us in a big way. So, so in 2011, in January, I had a baby and I was like, I can't, <laughs> I'm not gonna like, work 100 hours a week and also have a baby. Like, that's not going to yeah. work. So um, I found a part-time job, a 20-hour-a-week job at a, de- at a different magazine. I still did one canoe two for a whole year. And finally, I was like, okay, <laughs> uh, something's going to have to give. And I mean, that was working out okay. But what I did was I saved up an entire year's salary so that when I did quit, I would feel like I had a cushion. And I told myself, if every year I could just keep that cushion going and make, that, make enough money that I still have a year's salary in the bank, then I'll keep doing it. So I I quit in May of 2012, I think, for the, like finally went full time, and so now it's 2017. It's been five years. So so you took this big risk, but also you had been planning it. Yes. Like you'd been planning it out. It yeah. wasn't just like a, you didn't just end up being here in this very successful <laughs> right situation. And right. Uh, very successful is in the eye of the beholder. Sometimes yeah. sometimes it's just being able to be free to do what you're passionate yes. about is success to many. Right, yeah, um, for but, sure. You know, you have your shop here, which is beautiful. It's a really unique, yeah. unique location. How do yeah. you? How did you get from you quit your job, you started doing that full time, till you have this really neat operation with, I, I, I assume around a dozen employees yeah. now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. I mean, we grew by leaps and bounds, and we we. I I don't know. I mean, I think having a good product is really the core. So when people ask me like. Like when I talk to me about how I have a business and all that, I say, you have to have a unique product. That's the number one thing. So having a unique product, for us, everything's online. So I always knew how to operate a camera. I was a pretty good photographer. I always took good pictures, which if it's online, you have to do that. You have sure. to be a good writer. You have to know some stuff about technology. Um, but we, we had a unique product out in the marketplace. And so we just kind of kept doing the next best thing. Like the next big thing we heard about was a trade show in New York called the National Stationery Show. And we went there for the first time in 20, 2011. So I had a four month old. I packed up my mom and my four month old, <laughs> my business partners, and we went to New York. I mean, I had a four month old. It was the most stressful week of my entire life. I bet. I thought I was just gonna just explode from anxiety, I think, because we spent $10,000 that we didn't really have to go to a trade show. But customers walk that show, shops, people who have little shops, um, some of those people who came in our booth are still our customers today, which That's is awesome. incredible. And they're our friends. I mean, they're people we go to dinner yeah. with when we go to trade shows. And and yeah, I mean, that's just it's just kind of crazy. And then, were you bootstrapping it? I mean, did, yeah. you didn't get financing, did you? you just, oh, no. Like, you guys have just Put your own money into own time yeah and sweat yeah so i mean it's we're lucky in that paper has pretty good margins you know like a, now a greeting card costs us 25 cents or something to make and it we charge two dollars and 25 cents for it so paper has really good margins so we could always just and carrie and i both had full-time jobs so we would just keep we'd take a little bit out for ourselves maybe and then we'd keep rolling it back in and um we did that for years until we both quit our jobs you know so yeah. Yeah, we just didn't, we didn't have to have that much money. We were making all this stuff ourselves. We were shipping it ourselves. Um, yeah, I didn't, I was like, what's wrong with all these other businesses? Why do you <laughs> have to borrow money? What do you mean you have a credit card bill, you know? And then you realize the bigger your company is, really the more yeah. cash you have to have to float it. So, you know, that's been a big learning. So how did you, at that point, how do you, how did you scale it? If you're, you know, you're, I guess you were, you were rolling all your profits back into the business. So you're building up a cash flow, but... Mm-hmm. You know, did you hit moments where you're like, oh, oh crap, we're, we're growing really fast. Yeah. We need some significant capital to continue to... We never had cash flow problems, really. I mean, in, we had some plateau years, I would say. You know, we built an office. Um, we remodeled a barn out on Carrie's family's property. And so that year, 2013, was a tighter year for us. We're like, what happened to all of our cash? Hold on. Um, but... It, but 
because our margins are so good for the most part, that's been okay. Um, you know, and then in 2015, into 2015, I bought my business partners out. So 2016 was another year where I was like, okay, it's time to rethink how we're doing some things because not only did I buy them out, but we had to move. I had to redo this building. I, you know, so now I went from having, from being the kind of person who like pays their car off with cash and has a 15 year mortgage to, to a person who has a lot of debt. I mean, I'm just going to go down guns blazing at this point, but you know, it's, it's, I'm really thankful that I had a business behind me enough that I could qualify for that financing when the time came and I knew what was going on and I, and I know enough about the numbers to, to have been, you know, I made a pretty educated guess that it's going to be okay. So, yeah, that's, that's, it's such a great story of somebody, you know, you're in a, in a situation where you have all these interests outside of your own job, which really makes it work financially for your family Right. and saying, I'm going to take a, take a risk. Yeah. I'm going to do something I'm passionate about and I'm going to figure out a way to monetize it in a way where we can create some freedom for our family. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So what what involvement is your does your husband have now in the business? Um, he always says he's a 10% owner, which I hope no divorce lawyer ever talks to him. <laughs> um, he always says, this 10% owner, I would like you to buy me some pens or something. I don't know. Um, he, he has just a regular 9 to 5 job at the university and gotcha. he provides health insurance which is great. Yeah, that is great. <laughs> um, so he does that. I mean, he helped in the shipping department for years and years. And mostly he's just been, he's really supportive and, you know, says, you do what you need to do and I'll be there, you know. And he doesn't, he's not, I'm the type A person. He's a very type B. He's like, okay, if you think that's going to work, <laughs> then I'll be here. So, you know, so that's been incredible. If I had had a partner at home who was like, I don't know if we can do this, that it would have been that much scarier I think you know yeah it seems really helpful when you have if you if you are if you have a if you're married or a partner or whatever that your your partner buys into this stuff yeah. you know that they're they can be supportive and there's it seems like they're in a in a couple relationship there's always going to be a risk averse person and like mm-hmm. more risky person mm-hmm. and I think that really is beneficial because you can kind of balance each other out sure. in, in that way how, how have you seen that happen for you for you all um well, I don't, you know, he's not, he just doesn't, I think he just trusts me complicitly, to be honest. And and I have to say for myself, I don't feel like I've taken a huge risk. Now, looking looking back, I, it, I could see how some people would think that it was risky, but I also feel like working in a job, you know, for $35,000 a year is, is a little risky because I could have aged out of that or I could have been downsized from that. I you know, all the jobs I had were great and I, I loved them. I love the people I work for, but you don't advance from graphic designer to CEO of the company. Like that's kind of the end. Art director is kind of the end. So I feel like, I mean, I mean, it, I, I could see how for some people it seems risky, but I, kn- I really know what's going on. You know, I really know. And I have backup plans. Sure. <laughs> you sure. Know, that's just and that's, that's saying. helpful. I mean, I think we talk about kind of big risk and it, it being risky. Um, when the world looks at it, it obviously looks risky, but the world also will look at it too. And they'll come in and they'll see your business and they'll say, wow, Beth's so lucky. Look what, you know, she's gotten. And it hasn't been luck. It's been really hard hard work. work. And the risk is the kind of this, this equation of, um, how much time do you give up the opportunity cost of doing that? Now you could have gone home at night, do your job and watch Netflix, you know, and continue to be in a job that maybe you weren't thrilled with. Right. Um, but you decided to say, well, I'm going to go home and I'm going to work on things that yeah. bring benefit and I'm going to give up this time and I'm going to do things that are hard right now because there's a benefit on the back end right. that you didn't even know at the time right. how, how big this right. would be. Yeah, I mean, I like watching Netflix as much as the next person probably, but <laughs> but yeah. I think in general, like, you know, I just, I think I probably have higher expectations for my life than, than a lot of people have, or I have, I need, I have a higher need for more stimulation and intellectual I just like to work on problems, you know, that's, I like to be able to show, have something to show for the end of the day of things that I've worked on. And and I want to have something that I can show at the end of my life that I've done this big project, you know? Yeah. So changing gears a little bit, you, you're in this really kind of neat relationship with some other women entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. from Columbia. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit about that and how important it is that you meet every two weeks and you kind of bounce ideas off each other and. Yeah. So, um, so I kind of have two mastermind groups. I have one group of women who are in my exact field. So we all have card companies. One lives in Boston, one lives in Atlanta, one lives in LA. And when we first, when I first got into this industry, you know, 
there's a lot of competition. It's a really tight market and um, and people that I talked to maybe weren't super open. And I'm, I'm just a nosy person. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to say, who do you use for your sales rep? Where do you get your cardboard boxes? How do you do this? And, and the flip side of that is that I'm really generous with information when people ask me questions. Um, so that group of, of women, I've made friends with them by just being really bold and just saying, tell me about licensing. How do you do that? And, and I know that each one of them that I talked to was kind of taken aback at first, but we have all sort of agreed that, um, camaraderie over competition, you know, helping each other out. And that has made all the world's difference, you know, so we have all this industry help that we can help each other. We have all this knowledge that we can help each other. But on a local level, um, I actually started my local group sooner, like earlier than that, than the national group, but the local group we call, we call ourselves Boss Jam. <laughs> so there's, so we all sort of have interrelated businesses. Um, one, one person owns an interior design website and um, a like pretty big e-commerce platform. Um, Liz owns Poppy, which is our number one retail shop. They're our number three customer after um, two really big key accounts, like big box stores, Poppy in Columbia, which is crazy. Um, and then my friend Kristen, who owns a graphic design company and our own agency. So we all sort of have creative-ish things. Um, and so we meet every two weeks and we take turns. We come to the table with one ask and one give. So the give could be like, I just read this great book. It's called Hug Your Customers. You got to read it. Um, and here's what I thought about it. And then your ask can be like, what do I do about this HR problem? Or, or what do you guys think about this new product? Or how does it sound to you if we say this in our messaging? Um, and, you know, or sometimes it's just like, what do I do about having to travel? How do I negotiate that with my family? How do I balance things? You know, am I being crazy? <laughs> you know, yeah. um, things that, that I can't talk to my employees about, that would be inappropriate, you know, to cross those boundaries. But these women are my peers and they are supportive. I mean, they're probably my very best friends. You know, we talk about all, all kinds of things. So we go on, last year we went on two retreats <laughs> for a couple of days at a time. That's where terrific. We, yeah, where we have like a, like a two hour, you have two hours where we talk about your business and your business only. And we get down to the to the weeds of it. And we have a certain level of trust now that, you know, they know, they know everything. Everything's an open book to them yeah. about numbers and, you know, my personal flaws and, you know, sure. all that stuff. So, and it's really, I mean, you, you, it's counterintuitive to what society says is mm -hmm. like, be strong and never show your weaknesses, right. but allowing people to see your vulnerabilities. And I walk with a group of guys in Jefferson city. So they're, mm -hmm. we're all in different fields. Um, that we're in different, we're in the basically the same life stage. We have young families, right. we're married, right. um, but we all have very different jobs or very different businesses. And being able to be vulnerable and talk about hard things yeah. is one, freeing, but two, you have this encouragement level beyond just your spouse yeah. that really can kind of understand what you're dealing with and kind of give hard, hard advice when yeah. it's needed and also kind of a, a, a shoulder to, to lean on to deal with, with things. So. How do you deal with like negative input? So you're, you know, you're in this meeting or you're with your, your friends and they're like, yeah, that's a really terrible slogan or that's a <laughs> terrible marketing campaign. Yeah. I mean, how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, I know well, I would do horrible. Like I, <laughs> I typically do horrible with that type of feedback, but it's really, in my opinion, beneficial that yeah. you figure out how to take that well. Well, usually we're all pretty good about saying, I mean, you know, like couching it either with a little bit of humor or saying, I don't think that's great, but here's another idea sure. and here's another solution. So, I mean, I don't think that we've ever, well, I hope not, but I don't, my personal feelings had not been hurt. I've definitely have brought some things to the table where I was like, what do you think about this? And nobody seemed excited about it. So I was like, okay, that's how that is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, if it, they're not super blunt, I guess, although we have certainly had some blunt conversations about some things, but I don't feel like it's been critical. And usually if you're coming to the point where you're like, I need help with this. I mean, I'm so desperate to get honest feedback that it's, I'm, I welcome it pretty sure. much. So. And is it, is it important? It feels important that they're entrepreneurs and they're kind of in the same area you are. So they kind of mm -hmm. understand what your business looks like right. because their business looks similar. You right. know, how, right. how important is that, that you're walking with people, not just like, not, maybe not that are, um, that can understand where you're at. Like, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I think we all, we've traded positions a bunch of times in that, you know, like one day I'll be having a problem figuring out like how to, how to tell an employee, you know, how to give an employee some good feedback. And then the next time it'll be Kristen who's doing the same thing or, um, you know, like, or, or we're trying to drum up more customers and how do you do that? 
And it's the fact that we've all sort of walked through a bunch of those. I just learned a lot. Even learning, like hearing advice from one person to another that's not me, I still learn from that experience. You know, I just try to be a sponge for all of that. So Yeah. And do you do you find that in moments that you've had had a time where they've they've kind of pushed you to do something you're a little bit nervous about doing, but they've been encouraging to say, yeah, take the leap or take the risk or yeah. or, or do that. Yeah. I mean, it, in both ways. <laughs> like, I, not that long ago, I was like, okay, well, here's my backup plan. Like, if everything goes down, I'm just going to lay everybody off and then I'm going to have enough inventory. And they're like, what are you talking about? Come down off that ledge. You're, <laughs> you are being totally crazy. And I was like, I didn't feel like I was being crazy, but okay. So, every, you right, okay, I'm going to be okay. You're right. You're right. I'm fine. Um, but then, um, but yeah, I, seeing that they're excited about it, I mean, I, I think of uh, my friend Liz who owns Poppy. She's so, she's so quiet and soft spoken, but at the same time, when she does speak, it's really impactful. And there's been so many times, especially cause she's a customer of ours, you know? So I feel like sometimes her input is so valuable because she's, she knows so much about what we're doing. So when she's says something I listen to it and there's a lot of things that she is a piece of advice or a piece of encouragement that have really stuck in my head and I'm like well Liz thinks this is good and so I'm I'm gonna do it I'm just gonna buck up you know and I and we have like a little bit of accountability to each other because if I say I want to do this scary thing like we want to launch subscription boxes and they all think it's a great idea then then I can't really chicken out at the last minute you know (laughs) you know so I had to I have to like take it more a little bit more seriously. When you say something out loud, it's a lot more likely to happen. Yeah, so. and that's that's exactly what's happened with these group of guys that I've been walking with. You know, I've been talking about podcasts for months. Yeah, and actually, with a best-selling author that I got to interview a couple weeks ago, um, he told me in January he's like, "You just got to start it." Yeah, and these guys that I'm walking with in Jefferson City who've become best friends of mine, they're like, "You just got to start it. You got to let let us help you. You know, yeah. what do we need to do?" And so every time we meet, they're asking, "So how's the podcast? How's the yeah. podcast?" Yeah. And so it really kind of forces you to, to say, oh, well, this accountability is really kind of forcing my feet to the fire. Like, I don't want to look like the guy that was like, yeah, I'm going to do it, and then I don't do it. Right, yeah. That's and a really important value of mine, too. Like, I, I'm not going to, I don't like to talk big and not do what I say I'm going to do, you know? Like, do what you say, say what you mean, you know? Sure. And so um, beyond that, you, you, there's a um, something you mentioned in an interview. You said everything made in the cheerful One Canoe Studio stems from a deep appreciation of life's natural beauty and the pursuit of curiosity. Tell me a little bit about your curiosity for life and try, like your artistic side of it, and yeah. and how that's translated into what is today. Well, I mean, I think that goes kind of just back to my person, my personality, and like how how I just am normally. I'm super curious about how things work. I I want to know a lot of things about a lot of things. I mean, if somebody says they have a catering business, I'm thinking, how does that work? Like, I wonder how they, what are their margins like? How many things do they have to do to be able to do that? You know, so curiosity for the whole world, but also, um, like, the confidence to ask yourself questions. Like, I'm painting this flower. Well, is this the best way to do this? Is there some other way? Like, I wonder what would happen if you do this, to be sort of a scientist about it, you know? Um, to experiment and try different out, try out different ideas. Um, you have to be curious if you're an artist because you have to be coming up with new ideas. Otherwise, you're just a designer, right? So that's a really important part of what we do. We have to be coming up with not just nice illustrations, but they have to be like a new concept and a new way of something looking or a new set of color combinations that people haven't seen before. So if I did nothing but sit at my computer and click through Excel files, which is tempting because I understand how to do that. <laughs> and if I did that all day, instead of taking the time to like go for a walk or to go to the library and just look up a book about bugs, you know, to see what that, those pictures look like. And if I, if I did nothing but just have my nose to the grindstone constantly, I would not be able to come up with creative ideas for products or for anything. So there's this whole creative process and uh, there's a really great book by Twyla Tharp called The Creative Habit, and it's about how how to make it a habit where you input tons and tons of stuff, just like research, research, research. And then when you the time comes to sit down and output, whether it's music or art or dancing, then you have this subconscious, like a soup that's been made from all these things that have just kind of been marinating. And mm-hmm. I believe in that like nobody else. I just believe in like getting out there, seeing things, paying attention, so that when you sit down to 
to output something creative and something new, you'll have something to draw on, whether you really realize that that's what's happening or not. Sure. So There's this author that's really excellent that I've read a bunch of his books. His name's James Altucher, and he wrote this book mm -hmm. called Choose Yourself. And he makes the, this point that you should every, every day um, write out like 10 ideas, 10 things you'd want to do, just 10 ideas every single day. I don't do this because I'm terrible at like getting up in the morning and that would be the <laughs> best time for me to do it. But the, but he says get up in the morning, write out 10 ideas or have 10 ideas every day and they, have, they can be crazy, wow. they can be anything. But it's like you do that every day for 365 days a year, you have you know, 3,650 ideas yeah. of things you can start, things you can do. Yeah. And he's like, you're just exercising this idea machine, yeah, your brain, exactly. which we don't do. Yeah. And it really allows you to learn how to be creative and think through, um, you know, you have something to write about. You have something to start. You have a business idea. You right. have your passions. You kind of figure out where your, your mind, where it revolves, where it stays. Right. It can be based on gratitude, like I have an idea to, uh -huh. to journal more because I'm thankful for my family or whatever right. it right. is. Um, it's really a great thought on, on allowing yourself to be creative and live in your passions. Yeah. And I think it's really, I think passion is really important. What I want to really encourage people to is doing things for the why, not the how. Mm -hmm. You know, like you may know how to do something, mm -hmm. but why are you doing it? Right. Why are you, for you, obviously it's this, this curiosity, this, uh, this desire to see art formed in your business. Right. Can you speak a little bit to passion and how much that formed what One Canoe 2 is today? Yeah. Um, I mean, I love art. I love making things. I, this is, you know, this is the type of person I am that I make things that look like this. I've always tried to make colorful, happy things. But um, I, I also think maybe I would be happy running a different kind of business. I just, I love the, the ultimate creative project of having a business, of trying to figure out where the money's coming in and what's going to happen. And and the daily problem solving that happens, you know. I think mostly I'm passionate about doing, and this sounds really self-centered, but ha doing what's best for me at all times. So what's best for me right now is that I take my daughter to school and I pick her up every day, mm -hmm. you know. And so I could not do that if I had an 8-to-5 job in Mexico, Missouri, <laughs> you know, yeah. if I had if I had a 30-minute commute. Um, I, I am really passionate about having employees and treating them exactly how I want to be treated, which is to say that they have a ton of flexibility too. And even though sometimes that's inconvenient, we can't have meetings at whatever time or, or on every day. Everybody's only here in the office on Mondays and lots of people work three days out of the office and two days in. And, um, but I believe in treating people like adults and they all, yeah. they all act like adults because I treat them <laughs> like that. You know, I'm, I, I just have an incredible team of people and so I'm passionate about treating people well. I'm passionate about um, having a, a group of people that works together to make something much bigger than the sum of our parts, you know? Like, we, we do incredible things as a team that I couldn't do. There's so many people, everybody who works here does their job better than I could actually do their <laughs> job. I mean, I'm probably the least valuable person, except I'm the one who's saying go. And I'm the one who's coming up with crazy ideas and making them all nervous, but could ultimately bring us money, sure. you know? Um, I'm passionate about doing something, I'm passionate about small communities and I grew up here and I thought I was going to have to leave and I, I did have to leave. Eventually I could come back and part of my decision to come back was like I could see the e-commerce landscape was changing and I was thinking with the internet I could really live anywhere I want and where I want to live is near my family, near people I grew up with in this small town where our great house that we love was super affordable and you know, like we live like kings in Fulton. You can you can live amazingly in a <laughs> sure. town of twelve thousand people. So, part of part of that passion and giving back to the community and, and making a difference is that we built a building in the middle of town, in a place where most of my employees drive from Columbia, which is kind of crazy, but they like their jobs, I guess. Yeah. Um, but we took an old building that had been abandoned for ten years and we fixed it up and we put a ton of money in it. We opened a new storefront that is great and really fun, but does not rely on fit traffic. And um, and we're the kind of business that can do that. And really, I just wanna set a good example for other people and other small towns. You know, maybe all this rural flight, you know, the people, the brain drain that's happening to the rural people, maybe this this is what could happen, you know? Yeah. We could all have companies like this, so. I certainly think, and we talked about this before we started recording, but that entrepreneurship may be one of the most empowering things that yeah. can be offered in local communities, especially rural communities. Yeah. If they're gonna be brought back to life, it's gonna take entrepreneurs taking risk right. and starting businesses. Right. And the risk may look small in the long run, right. but to most of us, 
I mean, the, the smallest risk added up over time becomes a big risk. Right. And becomes a big reward. Right. And that's right. that's significant. I'm curious about if there, you know, the, the younger generation of people, and I'm on the very cusp of being a millennial, but millennial are, millennials are so used to making their own schedule and, and making the life that they want for themselves, and they place such a big emphasis on that. I'm curious if there will be more entrepreneurs happening and yeah. because of the you know the internet and you know <clears throat> excuse me you know small towns were built on entrepreneurs mm -hmm. you know the tire shop the grocery store there used to be clothing stores you know all those little places all these little towns lots of people's parents were entrepreneurs and maybe they've been priced out of the business or whatever and maybe we just need to change our way of thinking about what a business looks like it doesn't have to be a retail location in a small town it could be you know, some kind of a call center, a customer service center, a fulfillment center. We, I've been trying to grow our business a little bit in bringing in somebody else and doing their fulfillment because we do a really good shipping operation. We have tons of space here. We're right in the middle of the country. Um, I think that's that's a way that I'd like to expand in the future. So yeah. And uh, I think entrepreneurship is just way down in our our generation. Mm -hmm. You know, so my my desire for the podcast is to really encourage people to start stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can do that on the side. Like I'm doing yeah. this on the side. I'm yeah. I have a this government job, and then I've got this other job on top of that, and yeah. I'm doing this like at night. Yeah, basically just trying to bootstrap this thing so people right. can be encouraged by the stories that they're right. hearing. But I think it's important that 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 our, our generation and younger folks start taking risk yeah. and they start realizing that you know it's there's just as much risk in in like you mentioned earlier in being an employee at a $35,000 job for the right. rest of your life right. as it is to start something um, and maybe not in the first couple of years make that 35,000 but right. maybe have no ceiling on on the other end right. of that right um, which is which is crucial to realize right yeah my youngest sister had a boyfriend who she they got in a huge fight one night and he ended up walking home like from the restaurant which was a long walk <laughs> cold walk because he was trying to tell her that I had the most potential out of any of the three of us the three of us sisters <laughs> yeah probably and, the wrong thing to say I, to your yeah, girlfriend <laughs> don't say that to your girlfriend who's in law school but um That's but so I think what he meant was like Technically, the sky's the limit. Yeah. You know, technically, like, who knows? I mean, I don't, it's, my own values are to have a nice life and also have to have a nice sure. business and provide a nice life for my employees. It's not to own a $5 million, or, well, I would like a $5 million company, but a $5 billion <laughs> company, I don't really care. You know, I, I want, I want to do the things I want to do in, in yeah. this little town. I don't want to have 30 vacation properties or anything like that. But yeah. But yeah, the sky's the limit. Who knows? Yeah. So. And do you bring that up with your sister every now and again? You make sure you she <laughs> yeah. remembers that we're a little competitive, <laughs> the three of us. So much That's so that so funny. last, I think it was last Christmas, I got into not an argument, but we just got into this big discussion, and I said, you know, because I, I only have a bachelor's degree, and both <laughs> my sisters have advanced professional degrees, and I said, you know what? I always like, I think I could get into Harvard. And I literally, like, I went pretty far down the path of looking at how, like, what tests I would have to take to get into Harvard Business <laughs> and, like, how much the entry fee That's is. That's so funny. And I was like, well, I would definitely, for $800, I would definitely try it. But then when I realized I was going to have to, like, take three weeks off work to study for the GRE, I was like, I'm not doing that. That's the line. <laughs> That's so funny. I'm a huge fan of, of sibling victory laps. As yes. long as it's, like, I'm the one that gets to do the victory sure. lap. Yeah. Like, I married... My wife is my sister's roommate in college, in oh, their yeah. senior year in college. So my my sister's always like, you, you know, if it wasn't for me, you guys wouldn't even be yeah, together. Yeah. So I get to hear that all the time. So yeah. it's fun to hear other sibling <laughs> rivalry, oh, um, yeah. victory laps and things like yeah. that. It's, well, my hilarious. middle sister and I recently put two and two together that our dad had told each of us that we had an IQ score two points higher than the other one. So, <laughs> so oh, that's a little why? Dangerous. Why? I don't know. He just, I, I think don't they, know. I think they tell you not to tell your kids he, your IQ He IQ definitely scores. told us. He did not tell my youngest sister, but he definitely t did try to, oh, I don't know. That's it, really funny. It, to this Can day. Can you tell us your IQ? I mean, do you want, you want, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Don't tell us. Don't tell us. <laughs> well, I'm just I, I took the test in fifth grade. I don't really yeah, know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't, know, yeah, I don't, I don't know, know that it does. It was pretty good though. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Well, you've Obviously. done great. You've, you've done great here. Yeah, before we, before yeah. we're done with this interview, which I've really, really enjoyed. Thank you for the time. Yeah. What would you say to an aspiring entrepreneur, some or or an aspiring person that wants to aspire to doing what they're passionate about in some form or another? What would you 
what would you encourage them to do other th other than just start which i think is a great yeah. quote of yours from a from another interview i read on better homes and gardens but yeah i i mean i think just start but start with research do your homework you know you can't just jump in and, and expect it to go well you really have to know what you're talking about be so curious ask everybody you know read everything you can everything's on the internet you can learn anything you want to learn you can get in a chat room or something and talk to people. I mean, that's how I learned how to print on a six-year-old letterpress as I read forums about how to do it and I asked people questions. Um, I think the number one things are have a really good product and know how to talk about it. Because if you can figure out those two things about how to get a message out and how you know to make something that people really want and need, then everything else will fall into place, you know. I don't spend six months working on a business plan for a product that's only average. I mean, <laughs> figure out your product first. That was so first. funny. That was like the front end of the just start quote is you saying don't do a business plan because yeah. it's like it just gives you yeah. a reason to procrastinate or whatever yeah. and not actually take action. You yeah. say just start. I thought it was terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you can start small. I mean, we still do, we still are bootstrapping projects. Like I mentioned the subscription box. Well, we're not coming out the gate selling 3,000 of those, you know, this is a project that we can beta test on a really small scale and do lo print locally and all that stuff. And if it does great, then great. And if not, we won't be out $30,000. Sure. We'll just be out $200, you know, so we still do projects yeah. like that where we test some things out and, um, and ego plays into almost none of our decisions in this company. And that's a really important thing to me. We, yeah you know, kill your darlings. It might be your most favorite thing, but if it's not selling, it's not selling. Move on. Make something new. Yeah. That's fine. That's terrific. Yeah. Well, Beth, thank you again for the time. And if, yeah. and if somebody wants to find you or interact with you, how would they, how, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, well, our Instagram handle, we're really active on Instagram, is just, yes, you are, is just one canoe two. <laughs> so the number one, canoe like a boat, C-A-N-O-E, the number two, one canoe two. Um, and I've said that a few times. I, when we came up with yeah. that name, I did not think people were going to have to answer the phone <laughs> saying that and all that stuff. Um, or on Facebook, or we have a website, onecanoe2.com. So my goal with Instagram, and we're almost there, is to have more followers on Instagram than we do that live in Callaway County. So there's, we You're have 40,000 40, followers. 40, I saw it yesterday. It's pretty close. <laughs> you created quite a following there on yeah. social media, yeah. especially Instagram, which feels like Instagram was made for what you're for doing. For visual businesses. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's great. Incredible. Yeah, it's well, great. Well, great. Well, Beth, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you. Your time. It's fun.